Good morning. Happy, happy Easter. I hope you're having a good day. You know, I, I, would, I would love to hear what your Easter memories are. I, I'd love to hear people say, well, this is what we used to always do at Easter. You know, chances are a, a lot of us did a lot of the same things. You know, uh, coloring eggs, you know, the way you used to you dip it in that, that vinegar smelling water dye. Um, there's a lot of candy involved, right? Um, you know, there's something to do with a bunny, right? But maybe, maybe just like Christmas, you know, sometimes at Christmas, we have to kind of be able to get past some of the, the childish th things that we have attached to this and, um, get to the meaning. We talk a lot about the meaning of Christmas, but what's the meaning of Easter? The Easter story is, it's, it's a devastating story. It is. It's it's devastating, and if if you if you watch videos where the Friday and Saturday and Sunday are depicted, it it can be very hard to watch, and because it is a devastating story, and it's true. So I. Uh, in my sermon later, I'm going to talk about that story, and I want you to allow that story to wash over you. Allow that story to affect you. Because I believe, just like the power, powerful word of God that does not come back void, that as the story of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that story does not come back void. It exerts a power on you and on me. Let's have a word of prayer as we begin this morning. Father, thank you for the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father. That story gives us such hope because if Jesus was raised from the dead, then we too will be raised from the dead. And that is the very definition of our hope, that we will be raised from the dead. Praise God. Hallelujah. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Agonizing days. You know, I, I appreciate that video that we just watched. 
there's just a lot of ways to look at the story of Easter and the way that that they put that video together, which we used by permission, by the way. Um, empty. Yes. Empty. That's a strong word. The three agonizing days are Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And they would have all been hard days. You know, and I think um, the three days of agony are our days. We don't look on these days as an academic exercise to, to spark our interest. That, that's not really the point. Uh, I can't preach this as if I'm the person that stayed with Jesus and reacted the way I should have, the way I would want to, with courage and faithfulness and solidarity so that I can talk down to people about it that i can't i can't preach that way we can we cannot duck responsibility as if we stand above it we cannot look down on anything that god's people did as if we can sit on judgment in judgment on them we share everything from their failure to their bewilderment to their fear to their surprise and joy this is our story. So I want to begin with it, it, Luke 22, and I'm going to use all the Gospels today. But failure, failure is, is a word that's part of the Easter story, failure. Then seizing him, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. And Peter followed at a distance. And when some there had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight, and she looked at, at him and said, This man was with him, but he denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. A little later, someone else saw him and said, You also are one of them. And I am not, Peter replied. About an hour later... Another asserted, certainly this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. Peter replied, man, I don't know what you're talking about. And just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the words the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Failure. Failure. There's no other way to put it. Oh, Peter, how could you do this? You who were so sure of yourself, everyone else might desert you, but not me. I will die for you. And, and he wasn't lying. He meant it. He believed it. He believed it to the core of his being. This is totally inexcusable failure which is the worst kind. And I, and I said, this is our story. We cannot speak down to Peter. We cannot look down upon him as if we've never done something similar. The inex inexcusable failure. So we sit in silence with Peter this day, not knowing what to say having no reply. Second, excuse me. Brutality is another word for the Easter story. Brutality. Gross brutality. Mark chapter 14, verse 65 says this. Then some began to spit at him. They blindfolded him, struck him with their fists, and said, prophesy. And the guards took him and beat him. I don't know what that means. I do know that soldiers who want to humiliate a prisoner do awful things. The truth is, I may never want to know. I may never want to know the details of this. I know things from capital murder trials 
that I helped with in South Carolina that I don't tell. Maybe this is like that. The details don't need to be told. The truth is, I'm afraid of brutality. I don't think it's in my nature. But it was not in Jesus' nature, even more pronounced than me. He was gentle and kind. And so today on Easter, my heart hurts because of this. The brutality. If you've, if you've seen the movie, movie The Passion, the, that's one thing that movie captured more than anything was the brutality. And our Lord and Savior had to go through that. Awful. That hurts. Another word, an Easter word, is taunting. Taunting. You, you could also use the word mocking. Matthew records... In chapter 27, those who passed by, by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I'm the son of God. In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults in him. Taunting. You know, when, when we first moved to Canada, I was in the sixth grade. And I, and I rode the school bus to school in town. And Mickey Bedore also rode that same bus, and we picked him up on the way to town. And I taunted him mercilessly that, that first several weeks of school. I, I'm new to Canada. I'm new to everything. And for whatever reason, I taunted him mercilessly until he'd had enough of it. And it's the only real punch him up fight I ever got in. But he just had had enough of it. And I don't know why I did it. it. It's the only time in my life I've ever acted that way. Maybe maybe because I was out of my culture and maybe I was trying to fit in. Maybe I wanted to belong and I was just doing terrible things. But it makes me ask the question that if I had been in the crowd that day, would I have been one of the taunters. And again, that's heartbreaking to just even think about that, to let that part of the story wash over me and, and to have to be that part of the story. I don't want to be that part of the story. But if this is our story, where, where, do, we, where do we fit? I don't, I don't think any of these people felt like going into the story that they were going to be the bad part of the story. Certainly Peter didn't. He thought he was going to be the heroic part of the story, but he wasn't. Despair is another word. Despair. The despair that the people felt. The despair that Jesus felt. Mark 15 says this, At noon darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I, I think we have built a lot of theology on this one thing that Jesus said. I believe we misinterpret what he was saying. I don't believe God turned his back on Jesus. God does not turn away from sinners. The problem is that if God turned his back on Jesus, then he'll turn his back on me. I don't think he did. And we have example after example. It, the whole essence 
of God coming to earth was not to turn away from sinful people, but to turn towards them. And so we have the woman at the well who, you know, had five husbands and the man she's living with, with now is not her husband. Does God turn away from that? Absolutely not. He puts himself right in front of her and faces her. Zacchaeus, nobody in his society liked him because he worked for the, the dreadful Romans. And he was probably dishonest, took more of their money than he should have. Did Jesus turn his back on Zacchaeus? No, he turned towards him. The woman caught in adultery. Does Jesus turn his back on her? No, he does not. Keep in mind, Jesus is God. When the man that was inhabited by a legion of demons and nobody could do anything. They, they tried chaining him up. They made him, you go live down there by the cemetery. We don't want to have anything to do with you. But did Jesus turn his back on him? Absolutely not. He did the exact opposite. And even in this story, God who's hanging on the cross, what does he say about the people who are crucifying him? He says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That is one of the most unbelievable statements in scripture. Here's what I do believe that this passage means. I believe that Jesus couldn't see or hear or sense the presence of his father. And I believe that he felt forsaken. He felt like God had left him. Now, let me ask you this. Have you ever felt that way? Yes. Yes, you have. We all have. We all have had experience where we feel like God has forsaken us or God has left us. And sometimes it's like he's left us and, and we understand why. Because we can be despicable. I think what we witness here is the humanity of Jesus. That he, he felt forsaken, he felt alone, but he wasn't. Even though Jesus said, why have you forsaken me? His father was silent, but his father would have said, son, I have not forsaken you. He doesn't say that. But right on the heels of this, we do see the faith of Jesus. Because in Luke, Luke 23 and John 19 record these two sayings. Jesus called out with a loud voice, father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. And John records, when he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. We see not only the humanity of Jesus, but we also see his faith, his faith to jump. I believe that when we die, there's something that we do. I don't know if we, if we jump into something, we walk through a door, we I don't, I don't know, but I, be, I believe there's something that we do. And I believe that as Jesus hung there on the cross, he could look down into the oblivion of darkness and he could not see his father. He could not hear his father. His father was in no way saying, hey, son, I'm right here. Like, like we do when we're on the side of the pool trying to get our, our, our child to jump to us. Hey, I'm right here. And, and we make it just as easy as we can possibly make it. I'm right here. I'll catch you. I promise you. I, Jesus wasn't hearing any of that. But by faith, he said, into your hands, I commit my spirit. And I believe he jumped. And, and his, his soul left. And, and he, he, he knew by faith that his father would catch him. And, and even the statement of it is finished. That is a statement of faith. I'm done. I did everything you asked of me, Father. I've done everything you wanted. I completed the task. You know, Paul talks like that too, that I have finished the race. And those are words of faith and those are words of accomplishment and they're words of joy. And so, and, and so we, we see this in Jesus. And, and, and so this concludes the life of Jesus. And, and this, this is the most obvious ending in the history 
of surprise endings. You know, it, it's sort of like when you play hide and seek with a two-year-old. There's there's no surprise to it. And, and this is this is it, it. Jesus kept saying, "I'm gonna die. I'm gonna die right over there." Kind of like I'm, I'm gonna I'm we're gonna play hide and seek, and I'm gonna hide. I'm gonna hide right there. And and then and then they're like, "Well, I wonder where he is." And this surprise ending is exactly what he said would happen. Exactly. But it was still a surprise to them. But, you know, this story, it's, it's not a sweet thing like playing with your grandchildren. This is a train wreck. This, is, this, is, this story is a train wreck. And I've been using words, very, very few of them are nice words. They're not words we want to be part of our story. Shock was also, they, 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 I think they were shocked and that they they wrapped him and laid him in the tomb. And I just think they just, they absolutely would have been in shock as they are doing these things because they just couldn't believe it. And then the Roman soldiers guarded the sealed tomb. Unbelievable, shocking. This is shocking. Bewilderment is another word that they felt. I believe that all day on Saturday, so we're talking about three agonizing days. Friday was, it was a horrible day, but now we're to Saturday and it is, it is also a horrible day. If they slept at all, they would wake up with this realization of the, the nightmare that is going on. The absolute worst thing they could possibly imagine had happened. And Jesus is dead. And and he's buried. The Romans are guarding him. I mean, th 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 this is no joke. And I believe that all day Saturday, the women agonized over how they would anoint the body of Jesus. You know, Jesus didn't get much. And I believe those women knew Jesus didn't get much. But we have to do this. It's the least we can do. That body must be anointed, and that was on the hearts of the women, not the, not the men, I don't think, the women. And this would be the absolute worst Saturday ever, as they kept the Sabbath and just had to sit there, hopeless, afraid, bewildered. And the men are frozen with fear. And the Romans have not only killed him, but they've taken control of the body. But the women know the body must be anointed with spices. They just, it, they, it, it must, we must do this. And it is, it was a woman that anointed Jesus' feet before. And it is a woman, women who come to anoint the body after. And women bring beauty to the world. They just do, when, when we moved into our, a one bedroom duplex when we first got married. Laura brought beauty to that, which I, I didn't even, I never would have thought of that. But she did. And, and women do this, you know, it's like when, when a man wakes up in the morning, you know, maybe he'll take a shower. He'll comb his hair for the first and last time of the day. But a woman takes much more time, but she looks a lot more beautiful too. You know, and when we give bags, we give gift bags to the police and to, and to teachers when we do our thank you events. And that bag is pretty because women do it. And by the way, Jesus first appeared to women. Now, none of this, none of this is meant to cut down men. We've had too much of pushing one down in order to lift up the other. As we try to honor Jesus the best we know how, let's put our gifts together. Let's put our ways of worshiping him and the things that we do to honor him, let's put them together, male and female. Confusion is another word. Confusion. There was a lot of confusion. When they went to the tomb, Mark records this. Don't be alarmed, he said the angel. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He was risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him, but go tell his disciples and Peter, 
He's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. See the confusion I'm talking about? I mean, these, these are agonizing days. Now we're on to Sunday. And I know we're very quick to jump to the resurrection, and the resurrection has happened, but they are bewildered by it. They are in such shock. This, this Easter story has been a, a roller coaster of a ride, to say the least. John writes this, Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. And they, and they asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they've put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned around and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. But you can see the confusion, even as she talks to the angels, even as somewhere in her mind, there must be memory of what Jesus said was going to happen. But this is, this is the, the trauma of these three agonizing days is, is real. There's another story in Luke chapter 24 with two disciples that are leaving Jerusalem and they're, they're on their way home to Emmaus. And it says that they're, they're talking to, they don't know it's Jesus, but it was Jesus. And they said, you know, talking about Jesus, he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. That's, that's a statement of disappointment that what you thought was going to happen didn't happen. Okay? But keep reading. And what is more, it's the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find the body. They came and told us they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. What does that say? And they and, and and they're telling this story to Jesus, and then and then Jesus sort of opens up Scripture to them and explains Scripture to them, and like they they're they're understanding the meaning of the Old Testament like they have never understood it before, and they just and they 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 invite him to their house, and and when he is breaking bread, they recognize who he is, and he departs from them. And they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? And they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. And there they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, it's true. The Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the, then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. You know, this is the Easter story. And yes, it goes all, I've gone all the way from failure all the way really to joy. Realizing that this story had a different ending than they thought it had. And it's a beautiful story. Let this story speak to you. Let the story itself speak to you. What does this story mean to you? What does this story demand of you? What does this story ask of you? What does this story require? How does this story change things in you, in us? 
let the story have its own impact. But there's a couple of things that we learn from this story. Obviously, there's tons of things. But one is that we are not in control. All this took place without any help from people. Keep this in mind next time you pray. So often it's, Dear Heavenly Father, here is a list of things for you to do. Here is a list of things you need to know, and here is a list of things you need to do, and I humbly ask you to do them. In instead, Dear Heavenly Father, please lead me into your will. Lead me into what you are doing. I want to be part of that. And I think that the church should be praying, Dear God, please lead us into your will. God is in control. We, we are not. Praise God for that. But the second thing that this story says to me is, I want to be like Jesus. There is a deep desire in me to be like him. And I hope and pray that desire lives inside of you. And this is what I mean by letting the story pull this out of you. That you would so respect and be so in awe and in love with Jesus Christ that you would say, I want to be like him. The brutality, I want to be able to handle whatever might come my way. And where I could, I could, my life would be a life where I could say to God, your will be done, not, not mine. And, and then I, I, I wouldn't put any barriers on God, you know, that, well, I'll do whatever you want as long as it's within these confines. No, the Jesus didn't do that. Jesus really said, Father, whatever, whatever you want is, uh, is fine with me. And I will stay faithful to you no matter what comes. I want to be like that. Even the reality of his humanity, that as we see him suffering, I believe, suffering from, from his own self-doubt, and, and you can see it other places in, in the New Testament, that Jesus did struggle with self-doubt, just like I do, you do. He was, he was human, but also his faith, that deep faith, that as he hang, hung there on the cross, feeling rejected, feeling the weight of sin, and, and I think maybe even concluding that because of that sin that was on him, his father has left. But his faith stayed. And, and, and when the time comes, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. I can't, I can't see your hands. I don't, I can't hear you clapping them so that I can, I can hear them. Uh, I, I, I don't even sense that they're there. But by faith, I trust that they are. I want to have that kind of faith. And so the three agonizing days were finally over. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's bow in prayer. Father, what a weekend that was. What a week it was. What a life it was, the life of Jesus Christ. And we can't help but think all the way back to the Christmas story. And now here we are at the Easter story. And, you know, coming up sooner or later is the Pentecost story. These are all significant stories that are significant in the relationship between you and humans. But today, Father, we allow this story to wash over us. The strength, the love, the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. We're amazed, Father. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Holy, holy is He. Sing a new song to Him who 
sits on heaven's mercy seat. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Holy, holy is He. Sing a new song to Him who sits on heaven's mercy seat. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing, Praise to the King of Kings, you are my everything, and I will adore you. Clothed in rainbows of living color, flashes of lightning, rolls of thunder. Blessing and honor, strength and glory and power be to you, the only wise King. Yeah. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Holy, awestruck wonder, holy, at the mention of your name, Jesus, your name. Good morning. Happy Easter. It's great to be with you today. And what I'd like to talk about is our new life with Christ. It's uh, Easter morning, and what I'd really like to do is contrast uh, what I would call the worldly view of life with the resurrection view of life. It really is a means of accentuating the hope that we have in Jesus. Why this topic? Because the resurrection is really everything. The foundation of our hope. Jesus said in John 14, 1 through 3, uh, that if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. Let's have a reality check for a second. Our days on this earth are numbered. And the older we get, I think, the more clear that realization becomes for us. We also live in a very troubled world. It's uh, one that uh, sometimes beats us down. 
it's difficult to to meet the challenges of, of this world. And we all struggle with this, but as Christians, we have genuine hope. The worldly view of life, and many people in the world, of course, look at at uh, followers of Jesus as weak or misguided or even intellectually inferior. And yet, the world seems to be chasing fut futility all the time. There's a, such a high degree of hopelessness in the world. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we will die. That seems to be the prevalent attitude. Often, embracing the worldview becomes a, a flood of dissipation. Uh, and by that, I mean that it's just wasting away. It's wasting away physically and certainly wasting away spiritually. Now let's turn to the resurrection view of life. In John 11, 25, and 26, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever believes in me will never die. It's the greatest promise of all time. Although we will all experience physical death, we have the hope of being re resurrected into new life in Jesus Christ our Savior. Romans 6, 8 informs us that if we died with Christ, we also live with him. And then finally, in 1 Peter 1, 3, and 4, the beauty of the re resurrection is summarized as follows. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Therefore, on this Easter morning, we celebrate the resurrection with just a profound sense of joy and a profound sense of hope that we will also be resurrected with Jesus. At this time, let me pray for both the, uh, the bread and the fruit of the vine. Father, we just come before you with an abundance of joy that, that we can look at that empty tomb, that we know that Jesus was resurrected, that he that he died on the cross for our sins, but that death had no power over him. He was able to overcome death and be resurrected as we will be resurrected with him. Father, bless us now as we partake of this, of this bread and of this fruit of the vine. Guide us in all things and let us be ever joyous of the fact that Jesus has risen. It's in his precious name we pray. Amen.